Yeah, good morning, people of Glastonbury. May God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ give each one of us his grace and peace this morning and evermore. Amen. So, our call to worship this morning, we're going to do together. So, I'd like you to say to each other after me, Be strong. Be strong. Do not fear. God, our God, God, our God, is here with us. Is here with us. Amen. Lord, as we come to you this morning, may we open our eyes to see Jesus in the face of our sisters and brothers. May we in our hearts and minds respect and value one another, remembering that all of us gathered here are God's beloved children. We come to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, let's sing our first hymn, Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim, 340. Dear Charles Wesley said he wrote this specifically to be sung in a tumult. To be sung in a tumult. Well, you know, some of his outdoor meetings got very rowdy. So that's what he wrote this one for. to our time of prayer and I would invite you again to join with me in this time of prayer we'll start with our prayer of approach let's pray God of all we bring you worship today the good things that have happened this, this week the upsetting things the shocking things the sad things Help us to find peace in our life, trusting that you share our pain. You know our need to be filled by your Spirit, moment by moment, day by day. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And our prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Blessed are you, O God our Father. From the beginning you have formed us in faith. Your voice of wisdom always calls us back to lives of service and love. At all times and in every place we give you thanks. 
for your love made visible in Jesus and for giving us the words and will to praise you. In the crib and on the cross, you have shown us how great your love is. You came to share our lives and show us the way to glory. That is why we praise you now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honour, power and might, be to our God for ever and ever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now we're going to have a quiet moment to reflect on our failings in the past week when things might have got better, have gone better, and then think how we could amend our ways. Our prayer of confession. God of above and beyond, known and unknown, we cannot be the judge of others as we follow in your truth and know your ways. We seek forgiveness for our failings and wrongdoings when our lives don't reflect the life of Jesus. Forgive us. Only you can see what's really in our heart. We confess now in the quietness of this place and in the turmoil of our being. Hear us, enfold us, forgive us, release us. Merciful Father, you know us and love us. In your grace, you send our spirit on us to set us free from the tyranny of sin and forgive our foolishness. We claim your forgiveness now, promised to us, through your Son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, hear these words of assurance. Remember, God knows our weaknesses and our fears. God loves us as we truly are. We listen for God's gracious words. Welcome home. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We come to our second hymn now, 420 by, I think, one of the foremost hymn writers today, Shirley Irina Murray. She's not young anymore, but she seems to hit her subject absolutely perfectly on the button. So, 420. <laughs>
come to our readings. We've got a short one from Proverbs and another one from James. Yes, first of all from Proverbs. And uh, um, Eric has very kindly written it out for us, so you may not be able to um, follow it in the Bible. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. Blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. Don't rob the poor just because you can or exploit the needy in court. For the Lord is their defender. He will ruin anyone who ruins them. And then there is a reading from James, chapter 2. And it's a warning against prejudice. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favour some people over others? For example... Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewellery and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonour the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you? and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbour as yourself. But if you favour some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. And it goes on, entitled faith without good deeds is dead what good is it dear brothers and sisters if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions can that kind of faith save anyone suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye have a good day stay warm eat well But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Faith by itself isn't enough, unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Abraham's faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God, And God counted him as righteousness because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you to our reader. First, the Proverbs, it's an anthology, a collection of sayings, and it's been gathered over thousands of years. It's a practical book of life and how to stay out of trouble in a lot of ways. Proverbs doesn't often come up in the lectionary, but you can see how it, some of it aligns with our letter f- from James. Now, Proverbs contain some absolute gems. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. I have that over my office desk and I also have it in the front of my book of preacher's notes because it is so important. 
but read with care because Proverbs can contradict itself. Proverbs 6, 4, don't answer the foolish argument of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Proverbs 6, 5, next verse, be sure to answer the foolish argument of fools or they will become wise in their own estimation. Oh dear. So should we be silent when we realise we're arguing with a fool or should we answer a fool's argument? Well, well, it depends. It's not just that. Our English aphorisms uh, can be the same. Look before you leap and he who hesitates is lost. So both can be true. So we have to pick the gems. The message of Proverbs really starts right at the beginning in verse 7. Fear, that's recognition. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge because there is no wisdom apart from a living relationship with God. And I think that's pretty good and we ought to have that. So please read Proverbs but keep brain engaged. We need to find the gems out of it. So moving on to gems, uh, James, when I first saw this and I had to choose this particular translation, the New Living Translation, as it uses brothers and sisters, most older versions say brothers or brethren. Actually, that's not quite correct. The Greek uh, is non-gender specific. Now, I would think a better one-word greeting in English would be kindred, not necessarily family, but including all people of like mind or belief. Does that make sense? Right. right. Now, according to Rowley, who you remember our dear Rowley, he says the New Living Translation is much newer than the NIV, And it has inclusive language, but it is also now the most accurate translation available. It's not a paraphrase, like the message or something like that. It's an accurate scholarly translation, and I'm sure he would love you to ring up and discuss it with him. Now, our letter from James doesn't pull any punches. This passage isn't meant to comfort and reassure, but it's meant to jolt us into action. Now, James is trying to set up a dualism for his readers. He's asking, really, are we a friend of the world or a friend of God? Are we a friend of the world or a friend of God? And that's something we should try and keep in mind. Now, some New Testament texts, they sort of draw a rather blurry line between faith and works. James is completely blunt He says, faith without actions that evidence that faith is not actually faith at all. From the start of the letter, James makes it clear that anything being a duplicitous person, that's double-souled, literally, um, leads, well, duplicity is, well, trickery, guile, falsehood, deception, Anything like that leads to unsteadiness of faith and we don't want to be tempted. He's saying those who are doers of the world, doers of the word, not necessarily just hearers, but those that are doers thrive and are blessed. Now, James shares a lot with other ancient moral literature, but he's not just concerned with instructions and manners because they just keep people in their place. James wants the continuation, doesn't want the continuation of the status quo. He's egalitarian, really, communitarian. James says things in a slightly different way in the verse before our reading. He said, keep oneself from being corrupted or polluted by the world. I would say, don't let the world leave a dirty smudge on you. That's my, that's my paraphrase. Now, the world is always judging people. It sizes them up, it puts them down, it establishes a pecking order. And God, who sees and loves everyone alike, wants the church community 
to reflect his, God's, generous universal love in how it behaves. Now, we know Jesus was always practical. Twice, we're told that the poor will always be with us. That's Mark 14 and John 12. Not because God wants them to be, or that they deserve it, but because of human nature and things happen. So, in ancient times, prejudice against the poor or those dressed improperly was common. Now it's more likely to be because of somebody's background or their colour. And we shall see echoes of this very thing in our next reading. I would say prejudice of any sort is an unnatural judgment and it's not for us ever. There are myriad warnings in scripture about being judgmental. 1 Corinthians 4, don't make judgments about anyone before the Lord returns. And we are warned we may be dragged into court. The implication is those with lots of money, and therefore good lawyers, get the justice they want, not necessarily the justice they deserve. The rich in James's day had an awful lot of power and they were very anxious about these new Jesus followers that were making such a fuss about an executed madman and they kept saying God's new world had already begun and they were thinking, well, who's in charge here? Well, Jesus has his answer. It's King Jesus who... Well, James tells us, doesn't he? It's King Jesus who's in charge. He's the Lord. He's the King of glory. Everything else is nothing before him. And Jesus re-emphasized the passage of Israel's ancient law. Love your neighbor as yourself. That was central to Jesus' teaching, and it's so true today. And it needs to be spelt out and applied. And this is the royal law that James mentions in verse 8. And it's the royal law because it's the law which King Jesus himself endorsed and insists on. Let's think about the last two verses about Abraham. James brings together two key passages from Genesis 15 and 22. Abraham first believes God's promise of a huge family even though he's childless. Then in Genesis 22, the awful episode of Abraham sending away his slave Hagar with the child he had fathered. Subsequently, Abraham faced a harsh test to sacrifice his son Isaac, the one boy through whom all the great promises to be fulfilled in this dark em and then in this dark episode you see Abraham stands the test he believed God would do what he promised and was prepared to put that faith into practice translating belief and faith into action even when things seem impossible ridiculous or just plain dangerous that's the faith that matters and through which we are justified. I would say James is challenging us even today. Is our faith the real thing? And what's, what's the phrase? Is our faith the real thing? And does it do what it really says on the tin? Amen. Let's sing once more. 713. 713.
I've taken our prayers of intercessions this morning from a book that I was given by John Pritchard, and it's entitled Breathe New Life into Prayers. So I hope that's what we can all do. And this one is called Circles, and I particularly liked it. For those of us that lead prayers of intercession, often we start with the bigger things, the world, and then we gradually come back to us. What struck me about this is that we're starting with us and going outwards in circles and I've got a thing about circles where we touch each other sometimes for a quite a short period but all of us individually have got circles that are round us and bigger and bigger let us pray in our relationships with others we live in a series of concentric circles with some people very close and others farther away. In our prayers now, we're going to have significant time to pray for these different groups and to ask God's blessing on them. So please use the time of silence to pray for the people who simply pop into your mind this morning. And at the centre of this circle, alongside us, are people with whom we live or see day by day, the people we see most often. Who are they? What do they feel and need most? For each of us, this will be different. But Lord, we now pray for God's blessing on them today. In the next circle are friends, members of our family, whom we feel close to, even if we don't see them often. Who are they? What do we want for them? How do we pray for them? So this morning we pray for God's blessing on them today. Another circle are members of this church community. Fellow members of what Paul, St. Paul beautifully called the body of Christ. We are aware that many of our members are no longer able to come to church. This is the same for churches all over our circuit. Yet we know them, we love them, and this morning we pray for them in their need, wherever they are. In our next circle are people we see in our daily lives, our neighbours, people we may work with, in our leisure groups, perhaps people we speak to at the shops, people we know but not that well. Who are you thinking of? Who am I thinking of now? Why shouldn't they also receive God's blessing? So this morning we pray for them. In our next circle are people all over the country. Some who we once knew, but perhaps they've moved away or we've lost contact with. Yet they still have a place in our hearts, in our memories. We pray for God's blessing on them. And now the farthest circle, people we know all around the world. Family, mission partners, old friends, former colleagues. 
such a big map, Lord. Who are we being nudged to pray for? What might they need? And we pray that you will place on our hearts somebody to specifically pray for or a situation this week. We are the body of Christ. We are a praying community. Go with us this week and guide our prayers. Gracious God, we thank you for the many people who are special to us in our many circles of relationship. Thank you for all they give or have given us in love, in friendship, in shared experience. Cover them with your blessing today and never let them slip from your gracious hand and help keep us praying for them faithfully in Jesus' name. Amen. And we bring our prayers together in the circle that is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Um, we're now going to sing once more, 251.
our gospel reading from Mark. The faith of a Gentile woman from Mark 7. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed of an evil spirit and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile, born in Syrian Phoenicia, Jesus told her, First, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, That's true, Lord. Even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Good answer, he said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. <clears throat> Jesus heals a deaf man. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man and heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephtapha, which means be opened. Instantly the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Mark is not the easy gospel some people think. Earliest, yes. Shortest, yes. But it progresses at a pace and it's very, very carefully designed. The earliest reference to it comes from Papias in the early 2nd century and quoted in the early 4th century by Eusebius, historian and bishop of Caesarea. And he said... Mark became Peter's interpreter in Rome and wrote accurately all that he remembered of the things said and done by the Lord for he had not heard the <coughs> for he had not heard the Lord but later followed Peter now in Rome Peter had been telling these stories for over 30 years because Peter lived well into his 90s Mark as interpreter would have got to know them well and scholars think this was John Mark, who was Barnabas's cousin. Remember Barnabas? Went away with Paul. Yeah. I'll give you a little example. Albert Einstein, that great man, was unwell and he was unable to give his lecture to a very august gathering of scientists. His long term chauffeur volunteered to give the lecture. He did just that and answered questions afterwards. Einstein said he had been word perfect. So don't think oral history is inaccurate. It's not. We'll set the scene. Jesus has walked on water. The Pharisees in Jerusalem complained to Jesus about his disciples and lectured them on what they should and shouldn't do. Jesus, in turn, lectured them on about what was clean and unclean. Now Jesus has gone to Tyre, which is Gentile territory. I think just to take time out and recharge his batteries for a while. So no surprise then when a Gentile woman approached him. Now there's the following exchange of words which was urgent and desperate on the woman's part and 
somewhat teasing banter from Jesus. I don't buy into the feminist agenda that some people have in mind that the woman puts Jesus straight and corrected his rather restricted viewpoint. I don't think that's what happens or what Mark intended. Yes, this woman accepts the insult of being called a dog, basically, but turns it to her advantage. Now, the Jews often referred to Gentiles as dogs, and what the Gentiles said about the Jews was just as uncomplimentary. If that woman wanted to straight, make a straight challenge or correction of Jesus, this was hardly the way to go about it. But we have to admit, her words were inspired. Now, Jesus was concerned in his early ministry that his personal vocation was to the Jewish people, that to tell them their deliverance was at hand and that was to be completed in Jerusalem. That's in all the other Gospels as well. Jesus believed, as any Jew might, that when Israel was redeemed, the rest of the world would be brought under the saving rule of Israel's God. Then the Gentiles would be brought in soon enough. But for the moment, Jesus didn't want to be distracted. But the Gentiles weren't to be excluded from God's love and mercy. So having said that and done some rather whiskey things, Jesus knew it was time to lie low. We have to see in some ways Jesus wasn't just an itinerant medical missionary. We mustn't see Jesus in a cosy image of a universal problem solver. If we do that, we miss the towering importance of Jesus' role. Jesus is to inaugurate God's kingdom here on earth. And that work would eventually lead him to the cross. Now, what Jesus did was seen by the disciples and obviously Mark as a sign that he meant what he said about things being clean and unclean. The old barriers, the old taboos were being swept away. The dogs under the table were already sharing in the children's bread. Soon they would cease to be dogs, becoming God's children alongside the others. Now we have to understand Jesus' words referring to this a temporary short-term urgency. Jesus felt that Israel had to hear the gospel before it was too late. And we must see that that short-term situation came to an end with the crucifixion, never to return. Remember, as Jesus dies, Mark, our writer, has the centurion confirm or affirm that Jesus was truly the Son of God. And from that moment on, what was anticipated by that Gentile woman all those years before became universally true. The King of the Jews had become the Saviour of the world. Now, we've all, we all heard the phrase, you can't keep a good man down, haven't we? So, Jesus is still in Gentile territory. He's healed one woman and her daughter, and he's healing again, and people won't stop talking about it. We might say Jesus is failing on two accounts. He can't prevent people talking about what he's done, and every time he wants some peace and quiet, he's found by a crowd. Does Mark want us to speculate why? Often we find in Mark, Jesus wanted to be alone, only to find crowds waiting for him. And Jesus couldn't stop them talking either. News didn't just trickle out, it came out in a flood. Or was it that Jesus wanted to give more of his beloved but obstinate Galileans the time, another chance, to hear the message and turn their life around? Well, when I get cold home, I'll try and ask these questions. I think Mark is preparing us for a new phase in Jesus' ministry, using the significance of this last healing, the deaf man. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. 
we can see, and I'm sure the Galileans at that time did, we can see echoes of Isaiah's prophecy back in Isaiah 35. Blind eyes will be opened, deaf ears unstopped, and the tongue, silent tongues start to sing. This was a prophecy of renewal after sad years of exile. Release from exile, that was healing, wasn't it? Of course it was. We have to remember, healing isn't just repairing bits of our fragile bodies that go wrong. It's far greater. We could say healing is receiving comfort in bereavement or under oppression, freedom from addiction or depression, freedom from relief from the burden of sin. How much more? Jesus' healings, actions are outward signs of God's love, grace, and power. Jesus' actions are showing God's love. And here we are, right back with James. What was he saying? You've got to have actions as well as faith. Jesus showing his faith in God the Father by his actions. By these actions, people started to talk. And what happened? Just after our reading... There were 4,000 people on the hillside waiting to hear Jesus. It's amazing what you can do with just chatting to each other, isn't it? These two small healing events are pointing to a great healing that will happen when Jesus is finally revealed to the whole world. And our present praise turns to absolutely full-throated song. Mark urges his readers to follow Jesus, not in a boring, conventional way, but be ready to see and hear things that make us and all creation completely astonished. Friends, I ask that we are never too engrossed with this world, that we fail to hear and see the amazing wonders of God's love and grace for us. Amen. I hope you know this one, 82. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder.
Let's pray. Lord, lead us when we lose sight of you through the darkness to your light. Lead us through disappointment and failure to a place of new calling. Lead us, though we often struggle and sometimes don't listen to your voice. Lead us, good Lord, deeper into your love for us. So as we go out from this place, may our lives always reflect the life of Jesus and our God of love, goodness and peace. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us Stay with us as we stay with him now and always. In Jesus' name, Amen. Shall we say the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.